Sinn Féin's press office in West Belfast. First reports said two men claiming to have arranged an interview at the offices were allowed into the heavily fortified building by an elderly doorman. Within seconds, shots rang out. Three men, including the doorman, were killed. Two others were injured, one of them very seriously. A Sinn Féin spokesman said a young child had been sitting nearby and is being treated for shock. All of the casualties were rushed to the nearby Royal Victoria Hospital. Hello, I want to welcome you all here this afternoon. I want to especially welcome the families of Paddy Loughran, Pat McBride and Michael O'Dwyer who were shot and killed in this office on February the 4th, 1992. February 1992 was a dangerous and traumatic time in Belfast. In the first week of that month alone, nine nationalists were killed in this city in separate gun attacks. That same week, a young IRA volunteer, Joseph McManus, died on active service in Fermanagh. The first to die was black taxi driver, Padraig O'Cleary, who was shot dead in his North Belfast home by a UDA gun gang. Two days later, this very office was attacked and the following day, two UDA killers walked into Graham's bookies on the Armour Road and killed five people, wounding nine others. The youngest to die in that attack was 15-year-old schoolboy, James Kennedy. The eldest was 67-year-old father of three, Jack Duffin, together with Christy Doherty, age 52, William McManus, 54, and 18-year-old Peter McGee. I want to extend our deepest and sincerest sympathies to the families of Patty, Pat, and Michael, and to all of those other families remembering their loved ones at this time. So I would like to call on the families to lay your wreaths. Fall Sinn Féin. Falls Commemoration Committee. And Family Reads. I would now like to ask for a minute's silence. I want to introduce Jerry Adams, who was then the president of Sinn Féin and who attended this scene shortly after the attack. And he also knew Paddy and Pat personally. Thank you. Thanks. Well, good morning, Jay Deepshire, August. Our dues for William, but we have some words, Deepshire, August. Baltimore, Goharaha, a horse, Rev. Charlie. Nadinia Furbas and Shaw Traha Blenohin. It was just after one o'clock, February the 4th, 1992, when IUC officer Alan Moore walked into this office. And not long before this, myself and Martin McGuinness walked out of the office down to Conway Mill for a meeting. And Richard McCauley left later which it was always later. And he had just arrived in Conway Mill when he got a phone call telling him that the office had been attacked. And Richard immediately rushed back. And he arrived here as the ambulance crew was carrying Pat McBride, who was still alive, out of the building. When Richard went into the office, he found two of the dead and Pat Wilson seriously injured. Now it was a different building then, 55 Falls Road was a small terraced house. The reception area and our advice centre were downstairs and our POW office and the press office was upstairs. Paddy Lockeran, a hugely popular and well-known local man from Clonard Street was on the door. Alan Moore pretended to be a journalist. Paddy asked him to wait 
while he buzzed up to the press office. Moore was armed with a shotgun, which he carried in a bag. Apart from Paddy, Pat Wilson and Michael O'Dwyer and his baby son were in the small reception room. You young fella, that's Michael's son here. Just recognise you when you were down the reef. You're very, very welcome, son. In the room behind the reception was Pat McBride and Nora Clark. Moore pulled out the shotgun. Paddy Locker and shouted a warning for those upstairs that Moore had a gun as the shots rang out. Alan Moore then left the building where he was grabbed by the arm by Marguerite Gallagher who was working in the Green Cross shop. Marguerite was dragged by Moore around to his car which was parked in Sebastopol Street. Paddy Locker and Pat McBride and Michael O'Dwyer were killed. Pat Wilson was grievously wounded and Nora Larkin was shot in the face. When Martin and I arrived back up here, it was pandemonium. The IUC were here, they were trying to close the building, local people were assaulted, and Sinn Féin councillor Sean McKnight was grabbed by the throat as he attempted to clear the way for the ambulance crew. The IUC were demanding that the office be closed, but those who worked in the building resisted. The building remained open. Later when the reception room was being cleaned it was discovered that the RUC had left behind the bag in which the shotgun had been hidden. It contained shotgun cartridges. The attack by Moore who later killed himself was in a large part a consequence of the protracted campaign of vilification of Sinn Féin and our electorate by the British by the political establishment here and in Dublin and by elements of the media. And this campaign was reflected in the news reports following the attack. One Brit tabloid headlined, Crazy Cop Kills IRA 3. Another presented as, The Revenge of the Terminator. While yet another said, Last Act of the Avenger. A last act of vengeance against the IRA. But of course it was no such thing. The reality was different. Like others of my age here, I knew Paddy Loughran well. For years he was a stalwart of Republican politics in the falls, and for a decade he did the door in our office. He welcomed everyone in his very understated and soft voice, whether they were journalists, foreign visitors, or people looking help and he referred to everyone, including women, as your boy. I also knew Pat McBride well. He was a committed, hard-working activist. I didn't know Michael O'Dwyer. He too was a family man. He called into our office carrying his two-year-old son, Michael Oak, and his killing was the second tragedy to touch the lives of the O'Dwyer family. In 1976, his mother Sadie was killed in a UVF bomb attack in the New Lodge Road. So it's important that we remember our friends. I'm glad Pat Wilson and Nora Larkin survived this attack. Nora is currently in hospital and we send best wishes and hope that she will return to her family soon. Pat Wilson, who was from the Clannard, made a complete recovery. And I'm conscious also of the family of Alan Moore and of all the dead and wounded of our long war. And thankfully the war is now over, although some are continuing it by other means. Now we can make no sense of any of this except in the context of British government involvement in Ireland and the conquest as well as the malign influence and the shameful methods the British have used and continue to use to maintain the Union. Yesterday's developments at Stormont are part of all of this. The end of British rule in Ireland cannot come soon enough. The Good Friday Agreement has an agreed process to do this if that's what the people want. What happened here 30 years ago was a brutal 
but futile attempt to oppose a corrupt system and to destroy Sinn Féin. It failed completely to do that, but at a terrible price to the Loughran, McBride and O'Dwyer family. Sinn Féin is now the largest party on this island. We continue to lead the process of change and there's a growing and widespread support for a new agreed and shared Ireland. And when that happens, we all know that it will be due to the efforts of comrades like Paddy Locker and Pat McBride, Pat Wilson, Laura Larkin and Marguerite and all the others who stood in the gap of danger. When British rule, when English rule in our country ends, it will also be because of the sacrifices of the O'Dwyer, McBride and Lochran families and all the other families who lost loved ones. So we thank them all and I will conclude by also thanking the comrades who organised today's event. Mila Weiss. I for one, and I'm sure I speak to for all of you, I look forward to the end of London rule here and to the liberation of the Unionist and Loyalist people along with the rest of us. To be sure of this, without the patronage of corrupt English politicians, they will join then with everyone else to forge a new future based on equality. Speed the day for Amina Margov. The attack on this office was not the first on a Sinn Féin Dalton, nor was it the last. This office had been bombed, RPG rockets had been fired at it, the British Army tried to set fire to it. Conley House was attacked several times and people were wounded there. Our other offices in the New Lodge in Ardoyne, as well as Dublin and Monaghan and other places were also attacked and comrades hurt. In all, 24 members of Sinn Féin, including three councillors, as well as family members, wives, sons and brothers were killed, mostly by Unionist paramilitaries acting in collusion with the British state forces. The three men killed in this building were targeted because of a concentrated, concerted British state policy to demonise Republicans. Our party was censored north and south, Every effort was made by the British and Irish governments and our political opponents to marginalise Sinn Féin, to force us out of existence. The nationalist people were also targets of this campaign. The five who were killed in the Ormer Road boogies were the victims of a deliberate British government policy that saw it arm, train, facilitate and provide information to Loyalist death squads. Ian Paisley pictured with a sledgehammer, said he would smash Sinn Féin. British politicians described the nationalist community as the terrorist community. The Irish government imposed Section 31 and banned us from using public buildings for meetings. A succession of reports by the Police Ombudsman's Office in the UDA and UVF actions in North Belfast, Logan Island and elsewhere concluded that collusion was real and was responsible for killing people. Just two weeks ago, the Ombudsman's report in the 19 killings across Antrim, Derry, Tyrone and Donegal found that state agents and informers working inside the UDA were directly involved in those killings. It also revealed that among the weapons used by the, the UDA were those brought into the North in 1987 from the apartheid regime in South Africa assisted by British intelligence and British agents working inside the Loyalist death squads. On Monday next, the families of the Ormer Road victims will finally receive the Ombudsman report into that atrocity and the killing of six others in the South Belfast area. The report will be published on Tuesday. The PSNI made strenuous efforts to delay publication of this report. A previous police ombudsman had to take them to court over the refusal to hand over information. The fact is that the British state does not want the truth of collusion made public. That's why they've refused to honour the commitment to publish the report into the murder of Pat Finucane. 
That's why the British have prevaricated and delayed introducing the Stormont House Agreement, which was agreed in 2014. That's why they are proposing an amnesty for their own forces. And this isn't just about covering up the actions of the British Army, the UDR and the RUC. It's also about the decisions taken at the highest political level in the British government, as well as the actions of their agents and informers working within armed groups. They don't want anyone to know who in the British government authorities authorised the torture of the hooded men, or the shoot to kill operations, or the waterboarding of prisoners, or the countless other acts of terror they inflicted on citizens. In January 2020, the British government gave a commitment to publish within 100 days legislation in the British Parliament to implement the Stormont House Agreement and address the legacy issues. It never happened, of course. On the contrary, in July last year, they published a so-called legacy command paper, which proposed a statute of limitations, effectively an amnesty, and to end prosecutions into all conflict-related offences. Under this proposal, the PSNI and Police Ombudsman, who has a remit to conduct historical investigations, would be legally prevented from investigating. The British proposal on an amnesty was unconditional. These proposals have been universally condemned by all political parties on the island of Ireland, by the Irish government, by victims groups, by human rights agencies and the churches and by all the legacy advocacy groups. This issue is about more than securing the truth for families who want it. It's also about transparency and accountability. Boris Johnson and the Tories want to protect their killers from justice. And Sinn Féin is determined to do all that we can to ensure that the British government's amnesty proposal fails and that families and victims get the closure they deserve. Finally, I want to commend the families here today. I knew Pat McBride quite well, and Paddy Lockern less so. I didn't know Michael O'Dwyer. But I know they were all good men, loving men, with loving families. So today as we remember Paddy, Pat and Michael, and all those killed in those terrible days in February 1992, let us wrap our arms around those families and all of the others and commit to doing all we can to ensure that they get truth and justice. Ramayla. I just want to thank everyone for attending today and particularly thinking of the families. Thank you. Thank you.